Thank you, Cheryl. All right. Well, kids are dismissed. They don't have to go to Sunday school, but it's available if you want. In the back, they'll be met by some teachers and some uh, Sunday school teachers back there. Again, if you need a cry room, it is available to you in the back as well. But with that, let me, uh, let me pray. It, it's always uh, after something like that, I feel like, how do you compete with, uh, with a performance? So let me, uh, let me pray and we'll get started. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for a beautiful day, Jesus. We thank you for your grace and your goodness. I pray that you'd speak to us through your word, Lord. Uh, some of us here, we're, we're, a lot of us are in so many different places. Some of us are Christians, some of us aren't. Some of us are here, we're, we're, we're struggling, we're doubting, we're dealing with sin, we're dealing with anxiety, Lord. Marital issues, divorces, Lord, you name it, it's here. We all have regret, we all have things. But Father, I pray that you would uh, work at this time. That you'd speak to us through your word. And where we need grace, would you give us grace? Where we need mercy and hope, would you give us those? In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 11. That's where we'll be at this morning. But I want to talk about a concept that we're going to see uh, in the text today. You know, if you've ever been over to somebody's house, like, like as company or for a dinner party, that there's certain questions that are appropriate, and then there's certain questions that aren't appropriate, right? And you've probably experienced someone at your house that asks you questions, and you're like, I don't quite know if that's appropriate. So some examples, like an appropriate question is, oh, you know, how long have you owned the house, right? What do you do for work? What are your hobbies? I mean, those are all pretty safe. But when they start getting into, oh, who did you vote for? You're, oh, how much money do you make to afford a house like this? Are you guys actually happily married? I mean, there, there's questions that people ask that, that, that can come off like, okay, hold the phone here. Um, but the, the problem is that the questions that, that are inappropriate are often the questions we want to know. Uh, th those are the juicy ones, like someone's political views. I don't know why we want to know it, but we want to know it. You ever felt that? You, you're talking to new coworker, somebody at church, whatever, somebody that's a friend, and you, so the back of your mind is, I wonder what their view is. But you can't just come out and ask it, so you've got to find subtle ways, right, that you've got to dance around the subject. You've been here before. You know what I'm talking about. You can't just say, who'd you vote for? But so you say little things like, um, hey, so what do you think about the border? What do you think? You know, because it can go one way or the other. You don't know, right? It's easy this week because of the Trump indictment. You can say, what do you think about that? Right? And then you're going to find their, their political leanings, how they feel. And we all want to know this. But the problem is sometimes you can misjudge this. You ever have that? Where you think, they, we profile them, they're like, okay, you definitely look like you lean in this political camp, right? You, you, you dress like it, you talk like it, you drive a big lifted truck with a Trump flag. I mean, I kind of, you know, you can misjudge it, but, but I kind of miss that. Um, you remember those huge lifted tr tr trucks, Trump trucks, with the 16 flags on the back? And, and, and whether you love it, hate it, at least they were outright telling you what they were. You know what I mean? And, and it's, I kind of miss that, that we knew, okay, you're with this side, you're not with this side. Or those people out there that they post 15 times a day on Facebook about their political views, it, it, at least we know, right? We, we all want to know. But it's a touchy subject, isn't it? It's touchy. I mean, just talking about this right now, you're like, where is he going? <laughs> what, what, what's going on with this? Why are we talking about this? Well, we're, we're going to find in the text, it, it's a really political text. Um, and, and why it's political, we're going to see, but, but it's kind of like this. Uh, in our government today, for politicians today, it, it's not easy. And, and what I mean is that they not only have to win their own party, um, but they have to kind of convince people from the other party to like them. And, and how they usually do this, on both sides, how they do this to, to win an election, uh, is they have to tell the people what they think they want to hear. You with me? Right, right. So a, a popular one is, hey, uh, I'm going to lower taxes, right? We, we're going to lower your tax. I mean, who doesn't like money? So most people are like, oh, lower taxes? Okay, I'm going to vote for you, right? Or, or hey, I'm going to build more parks. Like, well, we like parks. Our dogs can run. You know, I like that. You know, they, they promise these things. But the issue is they often promise stuff, then they get in office, and what happens? Oftentimes that doesn't happen. And so what we see is their popularity in the polls, it will change when they don't do what they said they were going to do. And we're not happy because we voted for them because they were going to do the thing that we wanted to do. And we're going to look at a group of people when it came to this political moment and the guy that came in, which is Jesus, they thought he's going to do something for us. And so therefore we're happy about him. Therefore, we're all about Jesus. But when he didn't do what they wanted, uh, they rejected him. 
And so what we're going to ask today for you and for me is, are we susceptible to that same kind of outlook with Jesus? Jesus, you're here to do stuff for me. Uh, I'll put you up in my life as long as you do what I want you to do. But when you don't do it, I'm not about you. So that's the question. Now, Mark chapter 11, as you're turning there, a little context of what was going on in Jerusalem and Israel at the time. Now, if you were an Israelite, if you were a Jewish person, uh, you felt oppressed. Because the capital, Jerusalem, uh, it, wasn't your na- it wasn't your nation anymore. It was ruled by the Romans. It'd be like for us, if you go to D.C. and you look at the White House and you see a flag of another nation on top. You were always reminded that, hey, we are oppressed, we are enslaved under another nation. The the building architecture was Roman. Uh, The coins that you use had the faces of Caesar on them. You were taxed heavily by the Roman Empire. You lived in this sense of, I want to be free. I got to be free. We got to be free from the Roman Empire. We despise them. This is horrible. But there was a promise that you all held on to and everybody knew about that one day God would bring the Messiah who would free us. He, he would rebuild Israel and we'd be free finally from the Romans. And everybody's excited right now because the word is spreading that that Messiah might be Jesus. You've heard people are going crazy because everyone's saying, Jesus just raised a guy from the dead. That means he's got power. This guy, Lazarus, he raised him from the dead. And on top of that, just a few days ago, he healed this blind man. And the blind man, when he asked Jesus to heal him, he said, Jesus, son of David. And son of David is another phrase for Messiah. Jesus didn't correct him, but then healed him. So the word is spreading rapidly. Hey, something big is coming. Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. We think he's the Messiah. So with that, that's where our text starts. Mark 11, chapter 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to him, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. This is an interesting way to start this. I mean, Jesus is about to go into Jerusalem. People are really excited. And then he pauses right before entering and saying, Hey, let's go get a donkey so I could ride in. I mean, that's like running a marathon, and right before you get to the finish line, you get on the little golf cart to go across. Like, you're not even showing your steps. It's like, Jesus, why would you walk all this way, then pause, get a donkey, just to go through the street? And if anything, why a donkey? Like, why not a horse, right? Like, like that's what kings ride. So, so what, what, why are we doing this? We don't, something that can happen in our government, but it doesn't happen a lot, but have you ever heard the phrase eminent domain? your political science, you kind of know, but that what that means is that the government can come up to you and say, hey, you know what? We require your land. We're taking it. Or it's like in those movies when the guys are like, FBI, I need your car. And they can take your car kind of thing. Um, back then, that was a common practice of kings. If a king was going into battle and he needed supplies, he needed food for his men, he needed a horse, he could just say, hey, mine now, I'm the king. And so Jesus here, when he's telling uh, the men, the disciples to go ask them, he's basically saying, tell them, the king, the Lord, has need of it. Sounds political. Sounds like he's, he's proclaiming something. And, and what's weird about this, too, is this isn't like Jesus. Jesus, in the past, whenever he did a miracle, you remember this? Whenever Jesus did something amazing, what does he tell the people right after? Don't tell anybody. Be quiet about it. The time is not yet now. But with the blind man that said, son of David, you're the Messiah, you know what? Jesus didn't tell him to be quiet afterwards. And then when he heals Lazarus from the dead, he didn't tell them to be quiet afterwards. Why is he not doing that? Because the time is now. He's making a statement. And the fact that he's riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9, the prophecy that everybody knew that when the Messiah came, it said he would ride in on a donkey. He's orchestrating his entry, and it's working. Look at this. It's going to come up here. John 12, verse 17. The crowd had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead. And they continued to bear witness. 
The reason why the crowd went with him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. There's this momentum gaining. The disciples are probably like, yes, finally. Finally, people are going to see we've been following the right guy. Finally, he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to get destroy the Romans. It's the time. Look at what happens next. Verse 7, Mark 11. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. It's like an inauguration service, right? It's like a coronation of a king. The people, when they say Hosanna, that means save now. When they put the palm branches down, that's like laying out the red carpet, saying our, our, our victory, our king of victory has come. This is the moment. And they say, you're the kingdom, a kingdom is coming. This is God. The Romans probably would have been on high alert. They probably heard about this. They're like, okay, there's going to be riots. We've got to board up Best Buy and stuff. Like, like something's coming, right? The, the disciples are probably like, finally. You're probably going to come in, you're going to go to the capital, you're going to pull a Russell Crowe like in Gladiator, and you're going to turn the whole Roman thing upside down. Like, this is the moment we've been waiting for. But look at what happens. Verse 11. He entered Jerusalem, went into the temple. That's kind of weird. Why wouldn't you go to the Roman capital building? Why would you go to the temple? I mean, Jesus, what are we doing here? Look what, he said, look what happens next. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late... He went out to Bethany with the twelve. He literally, this triumphal entry, everybody's talking about it, Jerusalem. They're thinking, this is the epic moment. The Romans are on guard. Everybody's like, what next? He goes to the temple, looks around, and then goes back outside of Jerusalem. That'd be like storming into Washington, looking at the Lincoln Memorial, looking at the White House, being like, oh, there's this really big statue of Abraham, and then you just leave. What are you doing, Jesus? Look at what happens next. Not in Mark, we won't read it, but, but he comes back the next day. And it says that Jesus went into the temple. Then he started kicking tables over in the temple. And the Jewish people were like, well, Jesus, what, what are you doing? Shouldn't you be uh, kicking tables over at, at, at the Roman Capitol building? They're the bad guys, not us. Why are you coming in uh, to this holy place, this Jewish place? What, what are you doing here? And then Jesus started teaching about morality and he started teaching about sin and saying, hey, there's a problem with your hearts and that's the real issue here. And they're like, Jesus, what are you saying? Like, we're Jewish. Like, we've got this thing together. We don't have moral issues. The Romans do. You got the wrong guy. I mean, imagine the disciples at this moment. They, they got so excited. They're like, this is finally it. We had this grand entrance. And then they're probably like, oh man, what now? What is Jesus doing? Oh, he's throwing over tables. Okay. All right, yeah, just don't eat like, that was the moment. And this goes on until eventually Mark 15, verse 9. It says this, he answered them saying, do you want me to release, a Roman official said, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews, talking about Jesus? And Pilate again said to them, what shall I do with the man you call king of the Jews? And the people cried out again, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. What happened? How, how do you have such a strong political start? Like he did everything right. He literally, I, I mean, what president, what king has raised somebody from the dead right before their inaugurate? Like that, that, that's impressive. He heals the blind man. He, he fulfills an Old Testament prophecy. does it perfectly to the T. People recognize it, say, yes, you're the guy. You are Jesus. And then within a week's time, they're like, not only are we going to remove you from office here, we're going to kill you. Like, that's a pretty bad political move. I, I mean, like, how, how do you get that so wrong? And the disciples would have been like, what happened to this guy? The reason why people turned is because Jesus didn't do what they wanted him to do. Right? We expected you to do this. 
We expected you to destroy the Romans. We expected, we had our expectations of what you're going to do as a king. You clearly got that wrong. You're not doing what we expected, so therefore we want to cancel you. You're out. They said no more. And the question for us is how do we respond today? We can do the same thing with Jesus. You know, there's a lot of preachers out there, there's devotionals out there, there's stuff out there that tell you, hey, believe in Jesus, uh, tithe a little bit to the church, do some good things, and God's going to bless you. You heard this? Right, right. If you do this, God will give you that perfect romance that you've always wanted. Uh, if you just give a little bit, you're going to get a bigger house, right? Or, or your diseases that you're struggling with, you want to be well, well, just serve a little bit in the church. You scratch God's back, He's going to scratch yours, And it's like this contractual agreement between people and God. And even in our prayer life, it can be like that. God, God, you know, I love you, God. I need you, God. uh, But please help this protein powder to work so I look ripped. You know, we have those prayers. Or or please help uh, the house to come into play. Bring prices down or keep prices up so I don't lose my investment, right? Like, we, we pray all the time. God, it's almost like an Amazon wish list. Right, here, here's my five star, my three star, my four star. You know, like this, this is what priority. God, would you give me this? Now, you're probably like, no, that's not me. I'm more spiritual than that. Uh, I, I'm not just like that. But let me ask you this. You're at a moment where you felt irritated or angry with God. You don't have to raise your hand for that. But, but you ever have that moment where you're like, God, I thought you were doing this. I, I thought we were on the same page here. I even prayed about it. I saw these signs that it looked like you were working. Uh, you were going to open the door for this thing in my life. And then all of a sudden, at the last minute, the door closed. And you were irritated. You're like, what happened? Like, like why, why? We were praying for a baby. Why, why would you let us get pregnant? And then there's a miscarriage. Why did you get our hopes up for that? Or I was applying for the job. All signs look good for the job. I even told my family about the job, and then I don't get it. Or we put the down payment on the house. We were in escrow. We even had it on the calendar with a smiley face, new house, move in. I told my friends about it, and then all of a sudden, they backed out. Like, God, why? You felt that? That frustration that comes. I was talking to a guy here, a buddy of mine this week, and we both have had those scenarios. I've had it in my life. There's a season in my life, early 20s, where life was amazing. Like, like I, I was super healthy because I was young. I was in shape. Um, I, I was working at a church in a youth ministry that was growing. Kids were coming to know Jesus. I had this car business where I was making money. I was in seminary good and good, getting good grades. And it felt like, man, everything I touched turned to gold. It was just like, Lord, this is it. I, as long as I follow you, you're just going to bless me. And that's the key to life. And I remember within six months, it all turned upside down. You ever felt that? Everything you felt like, oh man, I'm stable, I've got this thing together, I've got a plan, and it felt like everything turned upside down. I remember walking, uh, I developed health issues, I lost my job, Um, it was literally, I had these horrible stomach issues where my food would come up into my mouth and be all acidic like every single night. You know, I, I was struggling, I got surgeries for it, and I remember walking the streets, I'm like, God, why? What? I thought we were on the same page here. I thought you loved me. I don't understand. You're supposed to be for me, not against me. So I began to question God. You felt that? And see, I think when we have those moments, when you have those moments of irritation with God when it's not going your way, the problem with that is that your view of God is wrong. We view God Like, God, you're someone I've elected in my life. I allowed you to be over me. I've allowed you to be my God, but I'm only allowing you to be up there as long as you do the things that I want and live up to my expectations. And if you don't do that, I begin to question, are you real? Are you there? It's like a president, like a king. We can do the exact same thing. But my question is, if you read this book, Does it say the purpose of mankind? Does it say the reason you were created, the reason I was created, was for our happiness, for our comfort, and for our satisfaction? Is that what this says? Or is there something else? JFK, his inauguration address, he said a super famous line. You've heard it. He said, ask not what your country can do for you. What did he say next? But ask what you can do for your country. 
Now that phrase, it's clever. Um, I struggle with it sometimes because countries are not perfect, right? And so you don't always know, can, can I serve my country? Do I agree with everything with my country? You know, so I'm not getting into that. But that phrase uh, works when it comes to God. Because I think we come to Jesus, we come to say, Jesus, you are here to do A, B, and C for me. But the reality is, when we look at Jesus, when we look at God, it should be, Jesus, here is my life. I am living for you. Isaiah says that we are all created for his glory. That we were created with a purpose, with meaning, with value. The reason He saved us, even in Ephesians 2, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And then He says, it's so you can live your life of good works and glorify Him after that. We have a purpose, but I think we've gotten this twisted in today's society because we're all about self. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, just, just go online. There's so many articles about you've got to find your, your self-knowledge, right? You have this knowledge inside you that you've got to find, and you just got to unlock it, and then you'll have true knowledge. But it's found inside of you. We're all about self-love, right? It, it, it's all about you loving yourself correctly uh, so then you'll be a whole person. Or you've got to have self-gratification. Figure out what's going to satisfy you, make you happy. Pursue that to the best and indulge in that, and then you'll be happy. I mean, I can go on, self-care, self-motivation, self-esteem, self-actualization, like there's all this stuff out there. I mean, come on, you go on YouTube, there's all these different videos that come up. I mean, it's ridiculous. Some of them are like, nine out of ten women will fall in love with you if you have this confidence. And, you know, did these little tips and tricks. I mean, there's all this stuff about how to develop yourself, how to be a better leader. But there's not a ton of videos on, here's how you help your coworkers do well. Here's how you help other people in the room uh, feel like they're of value uh, and help them succeed. Here's how your life can have meaning by laying it down for someone else. What did Jesus say about self? Well, he talked a lot about self-denial, self-control, self-sacrifice, laying yourself down for others, even your enemies. He talked about submission. He taught James 4, 7, he says, submit yourselves... Therefore, to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he might exalt you. Jesus, when he's going into Jerusalem, he was on a mission. He was the king. He is the king. They were right in worshiping. They were right in bowing down. But what they wanted was wrong. They didn't realize what he was there to save them from. Jesus wanted to save them, not from the Romans, but from themselves. And that's the message of this book, is that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is, as much as we hype ourselves up, as much as we lie to the people around us and say, oh, everything's great, my house, uh, my family, we all love each other. Meanwhile, the house is exploding in the background and we're, like, like, we, we've tried to put up this facade that we've got it all together. And I'm self-confident, I'm self-motivated, I self, have all this self-knowledge, I have it together, right? I'm going to show everybody that I'm good. As much as we put up that mask and try to show everybody that we have it together, deep down I think you know that you don't have it all together. And deep down, God sees through it all, right? He sees through everything. He knows our thoughts, the intentions of our heart. And He sees it and says, hey, you're sinful, you're corrupt, but hey, I want to come and I want to die and I want to save you from your sin, from yourself. Jesus was here for the real issue. Jesus was here to save mankind. And that's the message that He was there to proclaim. And if you get this, if you really understand this about self, it makes your life better. I mean, think about, like, like, look at society. We're more about self than we ever have. Are people happier? Because I, I look at people, and it seems like we're more sensitive and more hurt and more offended than we've ever been. We're like a bunch of delicate peaches, you know, don't bruise me, you know, don't, don't say anything. Right? Everybody. It's because we're so self-absorbed of, you better respect me, you better lift me up, you better not offend me. What does that do? That makes us sensitive, it makes us weak. If you're so self-absorbed, it makes you bitter and angry because no one can live up to the expectations that you have. So you're always like, oh, well, if you're not going to treat me like that, I'm not going to treat you like this, and you need to do this and this and this for me. My expectations are over the top, and so I'm bitter or I'm angry because they can't live up to it. 
Or you're constantly pursuing happiness. You're like, I need to be happy. I need to be self-fulfilled. So i got to seek and seek. But then I never, I get it, but it's not happy enough. I get the career, doesn't satisfy. I get the relationship, doesn't satisfy. And so we die unhappy people that aren't satisfied. But see, Jesus, when he says, hey, there's more to life than just you, when you get that, when you're free from that, it's actually one of the most satisfying and joy-bringing concepts that you'll ever understand. Let me give you an example. About a month ago, my buddy came by with his truck, and he had a question with it. And meanwhile, his, his little boy, uh, big little boy, okay, like, like this isn't like he, cute, cute as anything else, but it's one of those little kids that's like, you're, you're small, but big kid, uh, goes in his diaper, okay? And it's not, you know, when infants go in a diaper, it's okay, it's like a little bird poop. When, when they get to be two or three, it's a big deal, right? And, and, and so he begin, he takes the little boy, puts him on the tailgate, and begins to change the diaper. And I'm looking at him like, oh my gosh, my wife's due in August, this is my future. You know, I'm like, man, how are you doing? Like, this, it, it just filled the stench, just filled the whole garage, the alley, when my neighbor moved out of town. I mean, it's just this whole thing. And, and I'm looking at him, and, and my buddy's just like changing this diaper. He's got a smile on his face. I'm like, What's wrong with you? You know, like what? You know, the baby. Sometimes with boys, you can get a little surprised when you're changing their diaper. You know, he's like wiping off his face, and, and he's doing this thing. And I'm like, what, uh, how, you know, what's what's your secret? He's like, man, I love it. You love it? Wait, wait, wait. He's like, dude, to be a dad, to love this kid, greatest gift that's ever come in my life. And it doesn't compute me. I, I'm at, I'm hoping I get there in August, but right now I'm still terrified. <laughs> but. But I'm looking at him, and, and see, that, it was a moment for me where I realized, like, that's really what Jesus was getting at. And if you have kids or grandkids, you know this. That there's this moment where you realize, this is going to affect my life in a huge way. This is going to really uh, come to com combat my selfishness in a massive way. But in that, there's joy, isn't there? It's not easy all the time. There's moments. But, but there's also an overarching theme of like, man, I'm giving of myself. I'm laying my life down. But yet there's this joy. And what you're seeing and what you're realizing is that is what you were made for. We were all made to worship God and to give ourselves to others. What's the greatest commandment? Love God. Love others as your what? Self. That's the key. And Jesus is here to save these people. They don't even realize it. And when Jesus saves us, He doesn't just make it so we could go to heaven, but He saves us from living in misery of love of self. And that was His mission. And they didn't even get it. But maybe, maybe you're here and you're not quite convinced. You're like, well, yeah, but, but what kind of God... Um, is all about self. That seems kind of narcissistic to me. Uh, it, it just seems like I, I don't want to be about that. I mean, the idea of submitting to an authority, like I've seen su a submission, that word can be so abused. I've seen it abused even in churches, right? These pastors, uh, are, are, they make people submit and they act in a horrible way. Or I've seen relationships where they've said, oh, you need to submit. I, I just, it, it's hard for me to think about that. You with me? But I think the reason we have that knee-jerk reaction is because we forget what kind of God is asking us to submit to? Look at Jesus. He's going into this place. He's riding on a donkey. Why a donkey? It should be a horse. Zechariah 9.9, the prophecy says this, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus, when those people, he knew they were looking at him saying, yes, we're for you. You've done miracles. Yes, be our king. But he knew within a week's time what they were going to do. He knew all of it. He could have just said, uh-uh, you're losers. I'm out. I'm turning around. Done. But he still goes to the cross. He goes willingly and humbles himself when they're not willing to. And that's what he does for us. That in all of our lives, if you're a Christian, you know that while you were still a sinner, when you were still pursuing yourself, your dreams, your life, He pursued you and showed you, hey, you're sinful, but I died for you, and I love you, and I want to save you despite that. That's the beauty of the Gospel. And that's the beauty of Easter season and the triumphal entries that Jesus came to save sinners. Despite, they didn't even know. They didn't even know why He was there. But he knew.
Look at Isaiah 53 says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That was for us. That's for us. But we can read stories like this and totally forget. Uh, a friend of mine grew up in the Middle East, and he said in his, uh, in his church, they, they were doing stuff, and people were coming, and people were being converted. And they started to get excited because they were like, oh, this is great. Maybe we're doing something right here. Uh, we've got it figured out. People, this is just, just great. And he said the pastor came to him one day, and he says, I want you to never forget Palm Sunday. And he's like, why Palm Sunday? He's like, imagine if the donkey thought all the applause was for him. <laughs> kind of cheesy. But I think we can so quickly think that, can't we? In our lives, that it's all about us. Meanwhile, it's all about Christ. He used the King James Version of the donkey when he said it. If you know the King James, the how you say donkey. I won't say it here. But the point is, is we can get this upside down. A man named John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. Right? It says in Matthew 26, 39, He says, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from Me, yet not as I will, but as You will. This morning, how do you respond to Jesus? What's your response? Is He just someone in your life that, that's supposed to make you better? That, 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 that's going to make your life better? That it's something that feels good? There's a lot of people that admire Jesus, that admire Christianity, and say, oh yeah, that's good. It, it makes me feel good about myself. Uh, I'm doing it so other people look at me and feel good. Or I'm doing it because I want my marriage to get better. And, and those aren't all bad motives. But if they're the only motives, you've got a problem. Or when you see Jesus, do you look at Him and say, Jesus, You are my God. You are my king. I surrender my life. You are my everything. It's not about me. It's not about my desires. I give it to you. That's why the Lord's Prayer, what did Jesus say? What does He say? The first line. Your kingdom come. Your will be done over mine. A few applications. Have you surrendered to Jesus? A lot of us, we can partially surrender. A lot of us, we can say, yeah, I'll let you be Lord of my life over this thing, but this area in my life, this sin issue, this desire I have, uh, don't touch that. Just turn a blind eye to it. I'm going to do this. No, Jesus says, I want unconditional surrender. I want to be your God and your King. Have you come to a place where you say, Jesus, I'm all in no matter what. I surrender. I give you my everything. Have you come to a place where you've surrendered and are able to trust Him? You know, sometimes we just don't know why God does certain things. The people of Israel, they didn't get it. I mean, that had to be hard. You got super excited. Finally, we're going to be free. Finally, the Romans are gone. It's over. We're going to be free. And that doesn't happen. That's hard. But some, not all, but some believed in Jesus. Some were saved and said, God, we don't get it, but we trust you. He was working despite it. And I don't know for you in your life, I've been here, you know one of the hardest conversations I have to have as a pastor over the years with people is, is when they come to me and they're like, Abel, um, why? Why did God allow this? Why did this happen to me? Why, why am I struggling with this? Where is God? And a lot of times, I don't know. But I have to say, what I do know is that He's real. He's sovereign. He's good. And there is hope beyond this life. There's hope beyond what you can see feel or touch and he's in heaven he's, he's prepared a place for you the scripture says that no eye has seen no ear has heard what the lord has prepared for those who love him and this is not all there is and that's hopeful and that gives me hope and that's what i live by there's moments where i just don't get it you feel that there's moments in life that are just hard and you have to pause and say god i don't get it i don't know why but i know you're god and i trust you i don't think that you know with job you know what happened to Job? Like, everything falls apart. At the end of the book of Job, does he go to God and he's like, God, why? What does God say? Well, Job, the reason why I did what I did, I'm going to put it in the Bible one day. It's going to be kind of poetic. It's going to encourage people. And that's why we're doing this. What did God say to Job? Job, 
I'm God. And you know what that, for Job, it's good enough. He said, okay, you're God. If you come to a place where you can surrender and trust, lastly, have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Have you believed in Him? Philippians chapter 2, it'll come on the screen, talks about Jesus humbling Himself, and then it talks about what our response should be, Philippians 2 8. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. If you come to a place in your life where you said, Jesus, you are God. You died on a cross, you rose again. I'm a sinner. Save me. And if you haven't, I want to encourage you, let today be that day. Come talk to me afterwards. Come talk to Pastor Allen afterwards. Don't leave here without being right with Christ. Because you know what the Bible says? The first time Jesus came, He came humble on a donkey. But it says He's coming back a second time. It's not on a donkey, it's on a horse. And He's coming as a warrior. He's coming to bring justice. And that day is coming. And I want to make sure that all of us, everyone in our church, has heard the good news of Jesus Christ and have given their life so when He comes, He's your Savior, not your judge. So let today be that day. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank You that You are not, you weren't just another political leader. I thank You that You were perfect in every way. I thank You that despite the Israelites not seeing what You were doing, You were still doing something. You were saving humanity. God, I thank You that even in the moments in our life when it feels like chaos, when it doesn't make sense, when we're questioning that You are still at work, that all things work together for good for those who love You. Father, I pray that those of us here who are Christians, that we would trust You more. That we go into this season saying, Jesus, I surrender unconditionally. You are my all in all. Here is my life. I surrender the areas I don't understand. I surrender in the areas that I'm struggling. Lord, I trust You. Father, I pray that there's someone in here that doesn't know You, Jesus, that it's not a Christian, that maybe today would be the day where they say, Jesus, I believe. I'm a sinner. I've been loving myself. I've been doing my own thing and it's not working. I'm not happy. I'm not content. There's something missing. And I pray that today would be the day where they say, Jesus, I believe in Your cross. I believe that You died and You rose again. Be my God. Be Lord over my life. I surrender. Save me. Jesus, come quickly. You are good and You are marvelous. In Your name we pray. Amen. Amen.